Good afternoon. Welcome to the National Press Club. My name is John Hughes, and I am the president of the National Press Club. I'm also an editor at Bloomberg First Word. That's Bloomberg News's breaking news desk here in Washington. Today, we will discuss the Paris Agreement that came out of the December UN Climate Change Conference. These accords may have far-reaching ramifications for energy consumers and energy companies. In particular, we will examine the U.S. electric power utilities and how they may need to change to comply with the accords. We have an extremely distinguished panel of experts with us today. And leading the discussion is Tom Friedman. He's an internationally known author and journalist. He has won the Pulitzer Prize three times for his work at the New York Times. Tom is also, I am proud to say, a past winner of the Fourth Estate Award. That's the National Press Club's very highest honor. And we at the club are thrilled every time Tom returns. And we're thrilled that you're here today, Tom. Thank you so much. Larry Kellerman. Larry is managing partner at 21st Century Utilities. He has spent over three decades in the electric utility, power generation, and independent energy industries. And during that time, he has overseen, acquired, and constructed over 20,000 megawatts of conventional and renewable generation assets. Joe Garcia. Joe is a former Florida congressman. During his time in Congress, Mr. Garcia was a member of the Natural Resources Committee and its Energy Subcommittee. In 2009, President Obama appointed Garcia as Director of the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity at the United States Department of Energy. Tom Kuhn. Tom is President of the Edison Electric Institute. This is the Association of Investor-Owned Electric Companies. These companies generate and distribute about three-fourths of the nation's electricity. Mr. Kuhn joined the Institute in 1985 as Executive Vice President. He was named Chief Operating Officer in 1988 and was elected President in 1990. Robbie Diamond. Robbie is the founder and president of Securing America's Future Energy, or SAFE. This is a group that dedicates itself to reducing U.S. dependence on oil. Diamond is also president of the Electrification Coalition, which promotes policies and actions to encourage the deployment of elect electric vehicles on a mass scale. I will be back later in the program to help with about 20 minutes of Q&A, but right now I want to turn the program over to Mr. Tom Friedman of the New York Times. Tom, take it away. Thank you very much. It's a treat to be here today. Um, and uh, we got a wonderful panel on an extremely relevant subject. I, I had the pleasure of being uh, in Paris uh, for the climate conference, and um, uh, it struck me as a very, very big deal. And a lot of people said, how could it be a very, very big deal when all it was was the lowest common denominator? Uh, and my answer was, you wouldn't believe how high that lowest common denominator actually was, okay? Uh, when was the last time you saw, um, other than a science fiction movie, 197 countries all agree on anything? Uh, and the fact that they all agreed on uh, establishing voluntary, to be sure, but uh, limits on their emissions uh, with regular reviews and transparency. Lowest common denominator, as that may seem, if you had been in Copenhagen or Bali, you would appreciate how high that lowest common denominator was. And it's going to ripple through the world of energy, uh, the world of um, uh, fossil fuels, and the world of electric power generation. And so just for starters, anyone who's been following this industry knows there's fascinating stuff going on in the uh, utility industry today. I wrote a book uh, several years ago, uh, Hot, Flat, and Crowded, and I had a chapter just devoted to the utility industry. And it was called, If It Isn't Boring, It Isn't Green. Okay? 
Um, and uh, it was my advice to young people today, which is that if you want to be uh, a green activist, uh, you know, everyone wants to be Al Gore. I'd like to be Al Gore. I'd like to win a, I'd like to win a Nobel Prize. I, I'd like to win an Oscar. Um, uh, but the real energy heroes are actually the sort of people on this stage. They're people who understand how a utility works. And when you understand how a utility works, because these are the beating heart of the energy industry, and you can make changes that shift us from uh, more fossil fuel-based utilities to, uh, to clean power uh, and different models based on maybe selling less energy to customers and being paid for that than more energy. That's how you really change the world. So Robbie, I'm going to start with you. We'll just go down here. Everybody take, take a few minutes. Take Paris um, for me, uh, your own perspective. What do you think the impact of this is going to be on the utility universe? So, you know, when I think about uh, the changes that have been made, you know, the biggest change certainly in the United States has nothing to do with government or agreements. It has to do with the low prices of natural gas and just technology um, shifts that we see on, from on-demand types of uh, technologies and efficiency. And so, uh, once again, in some cases, the governments are uh, catching, catching up, uh, certainly from a U.S. perspective and regulators. And in some cases, I get nervous that, um, Paris aside, let's talk about the U.S., that, um, and you know, we were talking about autonomous self-driving cars back there, you know, we live in such a rapidly changing world and we have all these systems that were created for a totally different era that uh, were constraining some of the amazing uh, gains we, c we can get. And so, you know, for me, because there's such a shift going on and things are changing so rapidly, it maybe is a time for us to step back and say, um, you know, establish the goal like they did uh, in Paris and then say, let's figure out how we're going to get there instead of telling people how they have to get there. Um, because, you know, in the 12 years I've been, I've been running safe, um, oil prices have uh, started at $20 and they've gone up to $140 and they're back again at $30. And we didn't have natural gas. We were going to be importers and exporters. Um, you know, the whole world just turned upside down. So I think that's really, um, that to me is, uh, is, is a big change. And the, the other thing I'd say is I think, forget the government agreement, but what, uh, Bill, what Bill Gates did, announcing uh, you know, the amount of money that they'd spend, you know, assuming they could spend. I think R&D is so important here. Because, as you said, it's, it's voluntary. And, um, you know, and if it doesn't cost, they can't meet the demands of people um, at the right price, uh, voluntary happens so we don't do it. So uh, to me, I think that innovation um, and having all that money that can flow to the innovation and come to these solutions is what's re really exciting. And I think there's a that by him making that announcement with all those uh, fellow billionaires, there's an acknowledgement that we got to get this grid storage right, and we got to get these things right. Larry, you're you're the only one I know um, who's excited about buying utilities today, um, <laughs> and uh, um, tell us why. How you tell the folks here a little bit what you're doing uh, with 20th Century, and and um, why Paris actually works for you guys. Paris is a tremendous opportunity for us. First, very briefly, 21st Century Utilities is in the business of acquiring and optimizing regulated jurisdictional electric utilities. Why do we want to buy electric utilities? I've spent my entire career in utilities, around utilities, and what we believe is that the electric utility sector is the most productive, constructive vehicle to create what both society wants and customers want, which is clean energy, low cost energy, and energy solutions that create choices for customers. It is the nexus of those three objectives that utilities can do best. Why can utilities do it best? Because the industry that we are in is the most capital intensive industry on earth. And those entities that can bring the lowest cost of capital and the most transparent cost of capital to the table are clear parties that can produce solutions for society. Who are those entities? None other than regulated electric utilities, where you have a regulated low cost of capital that is visible, transparent, and available on a democratic basis 
throughout the entire service territory that they have been allocated. So we believe that utilities are the most constructive organizations and enterprises in this country to facilitate the objectives of Paris, the objectives of the Clean Power Plan, and frankly, the objectives of the vast majority of our society who wants to see those objectives permeating our world. Tom, you, you've been uh, minding your own business um, at Edison Electric, um, uh, really in many ways representing the utility world. Uh, it was a model that was pretty sane for about 100 years. Um, uh, now I go talk to utility execs, and I, I really see an incredible spectrum. I see people uh, embracing uh, distributed models of solar generation and whatnot. Um, on one end, to people digging in their heels uh, on the other. What, what's it like to be trying to represent an industry in disruption now, and how does Paris even encourage that? Well, Tom, I very much appreciate you mentioning that we're not boring. Right. <laughs> I, I certainly never found it that way. And Larry, uh, I don't take umbrage to the fact that you haven't offered to buy EI. <laughs> But uh, it really is a pretty exciting place these days. And I, I always say that the you know, industry has changed as a result of technology. You've written a lot about that, uh, public policies and changing customers and marketers, uh, markets. And we certainly have a lot of all of that going on right now. Uh, and you also mentioned the fact that uh, one of the reasons not born is because of the movement toward addi additionally being green. Well, I am very, very proud of the fact that the record of our industry has been pretty phenomenal since, uh, since 1990 when I became president of EEI. Uh, electricity growth has increased substantially, you know, more than 35%. And we've reduced emissions of uh, nitrogen by 75%, of, of uh, sulfur by 80%. Uh, we're heading to 90% on mercury. And, and again, as you go around the world, Britain, about different places, India and China, you know those are real problems for other major countries. And we are already from 2005 levels, the president set up the goals from that standpoint for we're already down 15%. The Clean Power Plan, which is really the roadmap to Paris for the United States for the utility industry, is uh, our objective is to get um, carbon emissions down to 32%. Uh, that's a pretty you know, ambitious goal for sure. and. Uh, it will be a challenging one, and it's different for different states. Uh, it will be expensive. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, it's, a, it's a situation where uh, we uh, got input into the administration about how to make the rule more flexible and doable, and I think we're going to uh, very, very much get there. The, you do see an overall major change in the industry with respect to uh, uh, you know, moving forward aggressively on energy efficiency. We're spending $7 billion a year on energy efficiency. How many other industries do you know will actually, um, you know, invest money so that their customers use less of their product? Uh, <laughs> we are, um, you know, we are investing $9 billion a year now in, uh, in, in solar. Uh, we've led the way in renewables. Uh, on wind, uh, utilities own about 100% of the wind in this country. We own 60% of the solar uh, that we've built that very few people realize. So a lot's happening out there, uh, and there is a transformation going on. about disruption? Uh, you know, that word came up about three years ago. Uh, I don't really see it happening as much as the challenges and opportunities. A lot of people that folks that say may be disruptors are actually turning into our partners. Mm -hmm. And we're working with technology companies to uh, partner uh, to do what's best for the customer. Great. Joe, what's the government's role in all of this, uh, federal government in particular? Uh, since a lot of this is locally regulated, the Clean Power Act obviously had a huge reshaping role. But um, what are you seeing from your end? Well, look, I. Clearly, it's an exciting time to be in the utility business. I, I participated in one of the more exciting times when we, we deregulated uh, tele telecom service. And uh, I remember I had just gotten to the Public Service Commission. I looked out into the audience, and there was a, a friend who was a journalist, and he had slept through most of the hearing. And uh, so I, I went up and, uh, in the break and asked him out to lunch, and he, he was speaking to his wife, and he said, I'm over at the PSC watching paint dry. 
Um, and it was an exciting time because some of these things are very difficult. And uh, the technology is transformative. The, the events that are going on in the world are moving us much faster along those lines. Now, clearly, there's a role for government to play. I think the president has, has set the bar, and he's moving that forward, and I think it, it makes a lot of sense. I think you're seeing Republicans come along uh, from being deniers to trying to find a solution. But I do think, overall, it's a win-win. I, I, I think uh, Larry uh, sort of put it out there. I, I, I thought by the time Larry was finished, Tom was going to offer him a seat on the board <laughs> at EEI before he buys a utility. But the, the reality is that the, the utilities are in a, in a fascinating place, uh, state-regulated uh, utilities, because there are 50 different experiments going on, and you're trying to see which one fits your consumer or your customer or your client best at the same time of making sure you've got the, the prerequisites from the government's point of view. And I, I think, obviously, Congress should give more leadership. Uh, I think the FERC has done some very good work. I think certain commissions have moved the ball along. But uh, what is done in states will, de will, will determine how we can more quickly deploy uh, the technology and uh, the opportunities that are there. Because Clearly, as big as the industry is, uh, the ability to add efficiency to it only makes us, as a country, stronger, uh, makes us more uh, uh, capable of confronting the future. And I, I, I think that uh, I think these are good times. They're scary because change is, is always scary, in particular in an industry, as you started this off, which has had very little change in over 100 years. So, Robbie, it's the year 2030. Mm -hmm. We're holding part two of this panel. I'm a little grayer, but um, other than that, everybody here is still here. Tell me, how did we get here, and how was the power generated for us to get here? <laughs> um, well, I think uh, you know where we are is uh, literally though. How did we get to this hall? There's two <laughs> scenarios. Well, I think we got into the hall with autonomous vehicles. Okay. Um, I do. I do believe that. I think that is a rapid change happening. Um, I think. Uh, the value proposition it, it offers people, um, both in uh, safety, with uh, 1.2 million people dying on the road every year, um, it's an epidemic. Uh, it's like we have a vaccine. It's mm. a vaccine, it's at that proportion, and here the government has their hands to allow this vaccine to develop, and uh, how could we stop it? Time, uh, anyone with children's, uh, I mean, here we are in cars holding our hands on a steering wheel, 70 miles an hour, a 3,500 power de death, 3,500 pound death machine, and we're willing to look at our phones. So that value proposition. So I think that moves rapidly. I think that becomes electric. And that then mm. plugs into our grid. And I've always thought the uh, heart of American, you know, when people are selling you, you know, time of day dishwashers and, and all these things, like, it, it's not enough money to matter to most people. Um, but people love their cars. And they love, uh, they love uh, plugging. And once they plug it in, it will be the largest, most popular appliance. And then, uh, and then it will matter. And then that goes so up the to the car grid. will be like the cell phone. It'll be the sort of killer app instrument that'll drive everything. I think it'll drive a, uh, drive a lot. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I see that happening. And then you add on distributive generation because battery prices become so low. And this whole idea of uh, storage is so important. Um, and the more batteries we produce, the lower the price, uh, the more inventions there. So you know, to me, um, it is very important on the storage front. Um, so I see ourselves in autonomous electric vehicles. Some will be shared and some will be owned. And I believe that those will be plugged into a grid that's becoming cleaner because you'll have storage um, that allows for uh, you know for more renewables to uh, get on uh, get on the grid, and so that's the future uh, we hope for. Now I think there are lots of impediments, a lot of incumbent interests that are able to uh, try to stop right, you know the regulations or slow things like this down. Um, I you know I even think about PUCs. You know we work in some uh, places with the municipal utilities. And just the speed at which they can move um, versus some of the larger utilities that have to go through these uh, PUCs that then deny them the rights to put out charging stations or, you know, do these things. And so, you know, I agree with Larry that they have this low cost of capital, transparent. I mean, why, why aren't our cars on our utility bills? I mean, that's hmm. the most perfect place. Here, let them put up the upfront capital for a more electric, expensive electric vehicle and charge us over time a flat fee. And so there's so many things we could do, but do we live in an environment that will allow us to mm -hmm. experiment and see these 50 experiments across the uh, country and then embrace them? Larry, instead of buying uh, utilities, 
what if I said, I, I, I've got you know, um, a little pile of money here. I'd like you to start one from scratch today. What would it look like? What it would look like, and obviously the we service have territories have been would matter. carved out. Start but, with but Montgomery County, um, because uh, uh, we've been suffering with them, <laughs> uh, <laughs> where I live. <laughs> um, yeah. We would not chop down as many trees That's as right. the incumbent <laughs> to begin. What, what that utility would look like is instead of the classic hub and spoke system, where you have large scale central generating plants located hundreds of miles away, connected with long strands of copper into communities and that and the voltage downrated and regulated via substations and, and transformers to get to your home, you would have more locally produced energy, whether it is community solar or rooftop solar, whether it is wind located adjacent to the communities in the rural areas where you would have bloom boxes and mm -hmm. other local energy production resources that would be part of an ecosystem that interacts very, very dynamically with customers' energy use itself. Mm -hmm. We would have a very, very clean utility. 10 years ago, we would all plug in a 100 watt incandescent bulb. Today, the same illumination can be provided by LEDs for three watts. You would, you would look across the community and say, how will we, as the utility, help you as the consumers to identify and to acquire cost-effectively all of not only the energy producing, energy storing, but also energy consumptive devices to make your energy use as, again, uh, I, I go back to the three points that I believe society is <coughs> driving to. Make your energy use cleaner, make your energy use more cost effective for you and society as a whole, and imbue your energy environment with a greater level of choice. The utility of the future in Montgomery County and in the rest of the country, we believe will have those three features as central to their value proposition. And take advantage on a dynamic basis of the new wonderful array of products, services, technologies, and tools mm. that, the, that the external world mm. is, is providing Producing. on a regular basis. Well, Tom, let me ask you the same question. Um, you, you, where you sit, you see the whole spectrum of utilities. It's 2030 again. Um, Robbie's got his autonomous vehicle. Larry's completely transformed Montgomery County. Um, what do you think the utility of 2030 will look like, the average utility? Well, it's, it's a great, great question. And, and I think that is the right question to ask because we really do want to look long term. And that fits in with a lot of other goals that we have as an industry. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've spent time with both my board and executive committee hmm. looking at those things. I, I would not disagree with my, either one of my friends. I think that. Uh, uh, Robbie, uh, I would just expand on that. I think that uh, electric transportation, uh, and we represent utilities around the world, um, presents a, hum a huge opportunity for a cleaner environment, uh, for safety, for whatever. Uh, and I think for you go to, again, Beijing or uh, India, or you know, the, the regular pollution problem is just horrendous. And a lot of that's because of the vehicle situation. So. Uh, Electrification is going to be a major theme, um, I, I, but it's not just vehicles. Uh, it, go to, down to the Savannah River and you see the, the, the port down there, or Savannah, Georgia, I should say. You see the port down there and it's, it's all electrified, huge dirks and cranes and things of that nature. You go now into um, Home Depots or whatever and they used to have diesel um, you know, uh, movers and now, they, uh, now they're electric. Uh, airports are becoming electrified. So, I think electrification is a major theme going on. In terms of what Larry mentioned as the utility of the future, I think that uh, basically <coughs> there, you know, the themes that we are looking at uh, is cleaner power, right? So I think that uh, for sure to meet the clean power plan and other things, there's going to be uh, a lot more renewables. Uh, uh, we've retired some 74 gigawatts of coal that have occurring over this uh, period between now and the early 20s, uh, 2020s. Uh, 
We have a, using more natural gas, uh, some new nuclear plants coming online, uh, a lot more renewables and energy efficiency. So those things are going to come. Uh, grid modernization is another theme. Uh, we have a, uh, putting a lot of money in the grid, $40 billion a, uh, a year is, being, is going into transmission and distribution. A lot of it's going to the distribution side with smart grids, with energy storage that we're looking at. Uh, with uh, data analytics uh, so that you're going to be able to really look at a lot more data in terms of how you can better serve the customer. Uh, so, and, and more distributed energy. Uh, and then, you know, the challenge is to balance, because there still are a lot of economies and efficiencies of the larger systems and larger grid, how to balance the two of them and make them work most, most reliably. And the third is customer solutions. How do we individualize customers and serve customers uh, in a better way individualized because they're not all alike. Uh, and so, again, that comes down to a lot of new technologies, a lot of partnerships with uh, technology companies that uh, may have more experience than we do in terms of getting uh, directly into customers. So those are all, I think, exciting opportunities for the utility industry. Joe, let me just fair a question for you and pick up where you want, but it's, um, what do you think government, um, uh, speaking of the federal government really, but um, dive in where if you want, um, needs to do that it's not doing now to enable these kind of scenarios? Well, right now, where you see a lot of innovation is uh, regulatory arbitrage, right? So uh, a guy who owns a, a company that has some new technology or, or wants to offer efficiency, basically he looks at the rate of return regulation and the spread between what they allow or what they allow in the market and what their customer, and then puts a finance mechanism in place to, to work it out. And, and I think uh, that's wonderful, but it of course implies that that customer is gonna have a certain um, um, money that they're going to invest or they're gonna have a credit worthiness that's capable. And, and I'll tell you, as a politician, right, when you door knock, which is one of the things that you have to do, and you knock in poor neighborhoods, where you find that one out of every seven or eight houses is in the dark, right? They, they didn't pay their bill, um, the, so they got cut off. They're obviously paying more per kilowatt than anyone else because they've got to pay for that getting reinstalled and they got to put a money order in place and you, you're seeing a family in the dark, right? But then when, when you open the door and you look inside that house, they have an old light bulb and they have a refrigerator that's 30 years old because of course the property owner has no interest. They've got no insulation. They are at a disadvantage in this new regulatory framework. And so when people do this regulatory arbitrage. It's not in the best interest of the utility because they're watching, they're shedding some of their best load without any, any broader ability to maximize that. And I think a utility in the future, that, that low income person may have one of Robbie's cars that he's sharing with people on the block uh, or, or in the neighborhood. Uh, you're gonna have a, a house where the utility has made significant investments for the system because they have a lower cost of capital, because they have an ability to make efficiency work specifically as opposed to the, the billionaire down the block who, who lays out solar panels on his roof and, and it's wonderful that he does it or the, the big uh, industrial concern that can send lawyers to the Public Service Commission and get a better deal than, than, than the public. Uh, I think what you'll see is a much more open uh, regulatory framework. I think you'll see a utility that has to compete more aggressively uh, and has to uh, use that technology, as Tom talks about, to uh, make sure they stay in the game. Um, Robbie, we left the office this afternoon. Um, oil was uh, approaching $30 a barrel. A lot of people are certain it's going to have a two in front of it if it doesn't already. Um, what do you think the impact of these collapsing crude oil prices will have on this whole effort? So, you know, oil, I mean, one of the, one of the challenges we've had is that, uh, oil, you know, oil and transportation has been disconnected from utilities. Um, and one of the exciting things about electric transportation is that you're no longer having this separation. Yeah. And every, every, what I like to say is you're plugging in your car, you're moving all your emissions or whatever upstream. So every change you made on the utility side no longer just impacts residential and commercial. You now are residential, commercial, and transportation. Your car gets cleaner every time. Every time. Every, right, and, yeah. uh, and it takes a long time to get those cars plugged in. So let's start today. And so to me, um, you know, one has to say that oil and also, so oil in the United States is a separate question at the moment about the falling price. Right. And the natural gas is similar. Around the world, though, 
um, where they do use oil to uh, produce electricity, it's got a, another uh, th dimension. But you know, we've always said that the volatility in prices is actually uh, is actually the biggest danger. It's not just high prices or not just low prices. It's volatile prices, yeah. because that's where businesses and companies and consumers are just unable to uh, make predictions. Or people invest in a company and then they're out of business. The uh, former CEO of of, uh, of United had a great quote where he said, "I can run a profitable airline at fifty dollars a barrel." And I can run a profitable airline at $150 a barrel, but they're two totally different airlines. They have mm. different routes, different planes, and everything else. So mm. um, volatility is, is the problem um, in, the way, in, the, in the way they are. And so I, I get very concerned, right? If I, if I were Saudi Arabia, and of course, you know, they were, they've been caught with some of this American production they might not have expected, but if there's a perfect scenario, right? If I'm a cartel, I want to have four or five years of very high prices, and then I want to drive those prices as low and as quickly as possible, having saved up my money in a big right. sovereign wealth fund, driving out all my competition, and then, and then go back to the, the cycle. So you know, this is tough on them and everything, but at the same time, it seems to be, uh, it, it seems to be very good. But I would make one more market point. Um, you know, I, I mentioned PUCs before. And kind of, uh, you know, I'll go after everyone at some point. <laughs> look, look at uh, look at investors. I mean, so you have David Crane of NRG, um, who you know wrote a four-page memorandum saying, like, I feel that for my children, I have to change the utility, and then started EVGo, an electric charging company, and and NRG Home, and all these companies that were going to change the world. Mm -hmm. And what happened? They first had to move all those assets out. Um, of their company because their their stock took a beating, yeah. and now he's no longer the CEO of the company. Yeah. So will investors allow the publicly held utilities to get to you know the vision that we have uh, pointed to, not just the uh, regulators? And you know I have I have my I have my concerns about that and seeing a bold new future. Larry, what do collapsing oil prices mean? And did the Saudis in Robbie's scenario underestimate the speed, scope, and scale of American energy innovation? to compete at these lower oil prices. And, and I do believe we can compete. Let me, by way of analog, take you back to 1941. That was the year in which one of the biggest renewable energy projects in not only this country, but the world was, con was completed and commissioned, Grand Coulee Dam. Mm. It was a huge infrastructure project, $300 million in those year dollars, which is a lot of money now. And in 1941, the market price of oil was $1.14 per barrel. Mm. And oil was a major source of generation fuel, especially in the western United States, where Grand Coulee was operating. Translated, $1.14 per barrel oil translates into 0 0.2 cents per kilowatt hour production cost for oil-based electricity mm. in 1941. The total cost of Grand Coulee Dam, even though it was 300 million, which doesn't sound like a lot in today's dollars, the fully allocated cost came out to over 0 0.5 cents per kilowatt hour, two and a half times higher mm. than oil. What, in its wisdom, and it was very wise, did the Roosevelt administration do under those circumstances? It pointed out that Grand Coulee Dam not only produced electricity, but provided other societal mm. values. Mm. Those values in 1941 were number one, irrigation for the, the surrounding agricultural community, and number two, flood control for a river that in the past had flooded significantly, provide, producing great societal costs. And what the Roosevelt administration did is it said, well, gee, the, the apples to apples value of the power is about 0 0.2 cents compared to everything else going on in a competitive space at that point in time. And these other costs are going to be allocated to other mm. societal values. Why is that a good analog? It's a great mm. analog because what we aren't doing as a society today is pricing, monetizing, valuing the environmental externalities associated with our industrial activities. We are not putting a price tag on greenhouse gases. We are not putting a price tag on, on a lot of other activities and initiatives that greenhouse gas creates. 
whether it is rising sea levels, whether it is social disruptions, whether it is true economic costs that society and governments are bearing. So even in a world of low oil prices and low fuel prices, in the power world, I would analogize that to low natural gas prices, mm -hmm. because natural gas prices are at, are at secular bottoms in this environment. How can renewables compete against, against fossil fuels that are cheap and don't seem to be mm. having a rising contango mm. forward curve? You compete by recognizing as a society the exogenous values mm. that are provided by renewable fuels, by not having these exogenous variables that are, that are creating excess costs that we as a society are definitely bearing, but we're just not pricing. Tom, how are your members being impacted by this collapse in, in crude oil prices? You know, I think Robbie indicated that basically the oil is, other than the transportation side of the equation, separate from the electric utility business because we use virtually no oil. Natural gas has not gone down a parallel amount? I haven't uh, Natural gas has gone down substantially. Yeah. Uh, and I think that uh, that has helped in the conversion of some of the coal plants uh, onto natural gas, mm -hmm. which uh, use, you know, which again have half the carbon content, so that helped in the transition to a cleaner energy, but it really has not slowed the renewable growth up mm. at, at all, or energy efficiency, or the other things that are out there. So, you know, basically any job succeeds on whether or not you're fulfilling the customer's needs, and they're still pretty much, even after 100 years, reliable, affordable, increasingly clean, and maybe choice is gonna be a part of that too. But I think that basically, um, uh, as you get to customer customization, which as I mentioned, um, you know, reliable is, is one of the key things. Affordable and increasingly clean has always been the challenge of how much does it cost to make it cleaner. Uh, well, with gas lower and with uh, renewable prices coming down substantially, there's the opportunity to, to do a lot of those things. And uh, we are, in fact, moving pretty aggressively in, 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 the, in the direction of doing those. So it's... Uh, it's a it's a win-win for the customer, and it's totally separate from the oil side. But I don't think you know. And on the transportation side, um, you know, so you could say, Robbie, you've got the statistics better than I do. But it's what about eighty cents a gallon or whatever around the country for the most part. You can drive a um, you know electric vehicle. Uh, but I think that uh, so that's still way below a two dollar number. But that's not the compelling reason people are buying electric vehicles right now. They they see great cars, they, they see great acceleration, they see uh, things coming along like the new parts of the technologies for autonomous and things of that nature and the environment and other reasons. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the excitement of the technology that is uh, building the markets in these things. Joe, what difference do you think um, in terms of federal policy toward this incredibly important sector of economy will make it, um, under President Trump or President Clinton? <laughs> well, I think those are two very, very different scenarios, but I, <laughs> but I. Uh, but both will be huge. <laughs> huge. <laughs> okay. Let me say that I, I tend to think that politicians don't lead on these areas, right? It's mm -hmm. very tough. It's very complex. People have uh, sort of visceral reactions. Uh, you remember when the president, uh, uh, moved on on light bulbs, right? There were floor speeches about they they wanted their particular light bulb. So, uh, I, I I do think that events are moving beyond the politicians, and it's why you see uh, utilities starting to begin to th rethink their role. Um, uh, I I think uh, of this as a as a public service commission on a PUC and. Sort of harking back to Robbie's criticism, I, I remember si sitting in, in in hearings where we were discussing the cost of service of, of lines, telephone lines, uh, uh, where I, as a commissioner, was approving a two thousand percent markup on call waiting, right? Because somehow, for the utility, that was better. So my grandmother could have her phone at nineteen dollars. Uh, they did. They didn't bother to tell us that she'd already paid for her phone three hundred times, right? Um, and so a new technology come, came on the scene. Some people were able to adapt to it very successfully. Some people died. Um, 
But there is no question that the, the regulatory framework allowed that opportunity to happen uh, to some degree. The politicians didn't lead it. Uh, in fact, it was a, in many cases a court order that began that sort of restructuring uh, from a small company. I think the, the same thing uh, in the utility industry is happening. I think uh, the utility industry has other examples before it, and they've seen, uh, in particular, the, uh, when I speak of this, the, the energy electric industry has seen this happen to their competitors, has seen what's happened, and some of them are adopting. Some, as you say, it, are, are digging their heels in. Um, but the, the, the process, I think, has to be rethought. So I'll give you an example. In Florida, in the, in the 20s and 30s, where I come from, Miami, Florida, homes had uh, solar water heaters. Uh, and they worked. They were fantastic. Uh, and then utilities came along, electric utilities, and they, of course, wanted to sell electric appliances. And so they'd go to uh, developers, and they said, we're going to give you and they'd put it in a rate base. They were going to give you electric ranges. Why? Because, of course, it, they got to sell more electricity. It made sense. It was part of the, the model. And so the regulatory model stepped in and said, you can't do that because you can't put all that stuff in a rate base. It's not fair to the system. Uh, and so we, we, we made this sort of rule, which uh, you know, much is going to be debated on, whether it's on one side of the meter or the other. And I think that's where a lot of this debate is going to happen, where, where that makes sense, where, where do we allow them uh, to, to go behind the meter, what can we allow them to put in those costs? How can we democratize, to use Larry's words, uh, this investment? Uh, but I, I, I don't, you know, it's, it's easy to get down on utilities, and I, I think we've been very successful. If you compare our electric utility system to the rest of the world, I think we've been tremendously successful in electric utility and getting it out, uh, out to the very edges of the system. Uh, but that model, just like Ma Bell's model, uh, has a, a certain uh, time life, and, and how we organize it or reorganize that will say a lot of how we go in the future. And I think uh, government has an important role to play. I, I don't think you want to be on the bleeding edge. You want to be on the cutting edge. California did some incredible things in, in energy regulation 20 years ago. I remember sitting on the commission when California was doing its electric... Uh, competition. None of us who were looking at it thought that it could work. We didn't know why. Others believed uh, it could, and it, it came apart, right? And it probably slowed down where we are, probably by about a decade, maybe half a decade. But that didn't mean that we weren't able to restructure it and put it in better format and create better, better, better opportunities. That said, a lot of that investment that California made on, on renewables we are getting a tremendous benefit today, right? Whether it be the wind investments yeah. that they made or solar investments, they, they became, they were bleeding edge and the California, the people of California paid a huge price, but the rest of the nation has been a beneficiary and the rest of the uh, energy uh, or electricity uh, markets have benefited. Well, let's open up the floor for questions. Uh, you wanna come up and um, moderate this if you would and uh, time to hear from you all now and uh, I'll let our host on. Uh, Thank you, Tom. Our tradition at the National Press Club is defer first to credentialed media. So if you in the news media could be the first to raise your hands, we'll take some from the media, and then we'll open it up to all non-media in the room as well. And when I call on you, I, we have a microphone in the room. If you could please identify yourself and the name of your organization. And just a general just caution to everybody, questions, not speeches. Go ahead. Hi, um, I'm Annalie Grant from SNL Energy. Um, I'm wondering if we can look at um, the goalpost that the US promised in Paris. Um, what needs to happen to get the country there? Will the clean power plan be how the power sector gets there? Um, or could we see some new regulation perhaps coming down the pike? Who wants to take that? Joe, you want to we'll go that okay. yeah. yeah, go ahead. I, you know, I, I think it's, it's all of the above, right? As, as cliche as that has been as a political discussion, but we're going to have to look at different parts of the economy. I think Robbie laid out a great sort of, if you look at from the car all the way to the top, you know, the impact that it's going to have. But it's going to require investment. It's going to require technology. It's going to require deployment. It's going to require a social investment, whether it be for the environmental benefits or whether it be for societal goals that you want to put, they've always been part of regulation at different times, right? Our, our, our shift in energy is also based on cost. And so it's got to be something that people want. Uh, but at the same time, I think it is going to require 
regulation? Well, in every, you know, every adventure starts with the first step. And the first step is pretty clear under the Clean Power Plan is that the, uh, the states develop their plans. And so there is going to be an awful lot of work this year and next uh, for the foreseeable future, the states developing their plans. And of course, the utilities are going to be in there with those states uh, working on, on how to develop the plans to get to the targets that they need with respect to those three things in mind, too, reliability, affordability, and, and making the targets increasingly clean. So that's going to be the near-term aspects of things. And so I think you're going to see a lot of a lot of different states will be affected different ways. There are talks about regional compacts, whether or not you go mass-based or rate-based. And so an awful lot of near-term decisions are going to come out uh, that will kind of set the path for the course. Larry, go ahead. Go ahead. Just to add one thought, the good news is that right now in this environment, Government regulation is working hand in glove with good old fashioned Adam Smithian economics to produce the right outcomes for our country. April 2015 is a very important month in the history of the electric power industry. It is the first month since statistics have been kept that coal was not the dominant fuel used in the electric power sector for electric generation. It was followed by the next four months where also coal was not the most dominant fuel used in electric power generation. And likely, when the DOE's EIA finalizes the statistics for 2015, it will find 2015 as a whole being the first year where that is the case. What drove that? Did regulation drive that? Actually, there was obviously some influence of regulation, but good old-fashioned economics. King coal is no longer king coal. King coal is no longer the cheapest power plant generation fuel in many parts, in fact, in most parts of this country. And that, more importantly than anything else, is driving the near-term trend to a lower environment, more environmentally benign environment. Great, thank you. We have a question right back here. Uh, Jennifer DeLoe, pardon my voice, with Bloomberg News. Um, just following up on that, uh, Given you know Arch Coal's uh, filing today, given the economics of coal, how dead is coal? Is it dead? And frankly, what's the path forward on CCS? Do you see that as any kind of viable option? And what would it take to make CCS viable? Larry, that sounds like a good one for you, given your um, previous answer. Uh, just to um, how dead is coal? Coal is is it coal, dead or dead and buried? Coal is more. It, the answer is it all depends. Mm. <laughs> Coal is, coal is not, not cost effective in many parts of the eastern and southeastern United States. Coal coming out of central Appalachian Basin, northern Appalachian Basin, and a large part of the Illinois Basin is no longer as cost effective relative to good old fashioned combined cycle natural gas fired generation. And as a result of that, you are seeing a number of trends. You're seeing, you're seeing the two largest utilities in Ohio stepping up before their commission and saying, please subsidize me to the tune of many billions of dollars so that I won't shut, be forced to shut my historically very cost effective coal plants down. This in the heart of the old coal country. In regions closer to the Powder River Basin, where coal is still very cost effective to mine and deliver, you are not seeing that trend as, you know, uh, as quickly as possible, except in those plants that are not fully scrubbed and are not completely um, able to meet existing environmental requirements. And they likely are not going to have the capital available to survive in the future world. We're closing down 25% of the coal fleet, right? Still leave 75% much cleaner. The, the older plants got cleaner, much cleaner. If you look around the rest of the world with the growing population, et cetera, there's a lot of countries that need coal, and we're you know, sending coal to some of those countries. I, I don't think that we should wish the coal is dead because it's a very, very important option uh, to provide low-cost, affordable electricity. And yes, we do have to work on the technologies like carbon capture and storage and other technologies that are looking to uh, reduce the carbon impact of coal. 
Right Sorry. over here. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Harbaugh. I'm with Environment and Energy Publishing. Um, now, the Clean Power Plan was kind of a cornerstone of the Obama administration's ability to say that we're going forward with the Paris deal. Um, I don't think any of the Republican candidates for president are particularly excited about pushing the Clean Power Plan forward. So what happens in November when we end up with a Republican, if, sorry, if we end up with a Republican president, um, how does all this momentum that you're talking about play out? That's a good question, Joe. I, I mean, is this unstoppable for President Trump? Um, no, hopefully he's stoppable, but... Um, no, it, it, but, uh, is the rule unstoppable? I know, if, I know. <laughs> I know you, what you meant. Um, he's a Floridian, so I'm, I'm not against him to some degree. Um, look, I, I, I think, I, I do think it's inevitable, right? You, you can argue this, but when the vast majority of Americans are committed to a concept, it sees its way through. It sees its way through in Congress. It sees its way through in the regulatory arena. It sees its way through in, uh, in, in almost every daily life, right? Secondly, the technology is driving us there. I mean, uh, I think uh, to Larry's point, it's tremendously important. It isn't that regulation got us what we've gotten. It's that the market has created this tremendous opportunity. I mean, when you look at the, the cost of solar power, and how it's uh, being, be, it's, it's, I think it's increased something like 7 or 8% every year, and its cost is going down something like 10% a year. I may have those inverted, but the reality, it's there and it's happening. And at those prices, it's deployable by almost anyone. And that is why you're seeing it happen. Now, obviously, when, when the, the, the government creates opportunities, it goes quicker. I mean, when you look at what, uh, what the utility industry did with wind power, from the beginning of the Obama administration to present. And giving credit to your college roommate, George Bush, and what he did, right, in, in Texas and, and his successors. Clearly, th it isn't like George Bush was a, a big environmentalist, but without question, or Texas is a very environmentally friendly place. And nonetheless, they are generating huge amount of wind power. They've made huge investments in renewables. So even, even in Texas, they, they see this, even though they may be legislatively on the other side, uh, the advantage there. And finally, just the sheer impact of the investment here as opposed to abroad. The fact that instead of buying oil somewhere else, we are putting it into technology in the ground in the United States. It creates jobs, that creates opportunities, that creates education, that creates all sorts of advantages that we aren't taking care, we aren't investing in, in the broadest possible way. And the utility, again, to Tom and, and Larry's point of view, is the, grit, is the best platform to be able to deploy some of those technologies because you're gonna obviously do it in a massive scale and of course still bring competition within that. Great, anybody else? That shouldn't be an endorsement for Donald Trump, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, would just, I would just add to that. Like, that's why I believe consumers are so important and technology is so important because at the end of the day, these are like billion dollar decisions and they're decade long decisions. And, uh, and they require, um, you know, sort of the politics and the regulation should not be the dictating factor. I mean, that's the whole crony capitalist charges that are, you know, that uh, sort of maybe one could argue is prevailing in this election. Why is Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump so popular? Well, certainly people feel like people in Washington are putting their thumbs on scales. And so for me, the question is, how do you get it in the hands of consumers and allow consumers to want to adopt? And if we can't do that, I, I get worried. You can only push water uphill you know, for, so, for so long. And you look at Uber and Lyft as an example, because I like talking about transportation. Um, you know, let's put aside breaking laws and all these other things, but let's just say consumers wanted it. Like once consumers had it, there was nothing that the mayor of New York could do to slow that down. He had to relent to, uh, to Uber. And I think that's a lesson. Um, one is at the speed that consumers will adopt things. And uh, two is how they will stand in the way of people taking it out away from them. And so for me, let's try to find solutions that are not dependent on one party winning or the other party winning or, or anything uh, like that that's so, uh, that's so human based. Um, let's uh, hope. Uh, Let's hope for more rational customers to uh, make the decisions. Well, let me close by asking everyone uh, this question. You know, if you were advising a young person today who wanted to go into this energy field, um, given the whole spectrum from electric cars to running a utility to founding a utility, 
What would you suggest for them, Robbie? I'll start with you. Well, it won't be a surprise to say I, I think this uh, whole autonomous uh, movement on vehicles will be the most revolutionary change in society since the Industrial Revolution, even beating the, uh, beating the Internet. It is, uh, if you think of how our societies are totally ordered, from parking garages to uh, just uh, garages to urbanization versus suburbanization, all these things are dependent on this automobile that there's 250 million in the United States. And once you uh, begin to take that away, and uh, what happens to regional airlines? What happens to insurance companies? What happens to hospitals, trial lawyers, you know, auto repair mechanics, uh, Amtrak, public transportation, all these things just are, are all made from this car that we organize our lives around. And so I, I think it's a hugely exciting, and I was just at the Consumer Electronics Show last week in Las Vegas, and over, uh, at least a over a third for sure, maybe even half the show is now cars. I mean, they weren't even there eight years ago. And uh, you just find them competing with each other. And so everything in our society is becoming bits and bytes. Um, and this is just uh, one more thing. And because, uh, because people want to get around, human need for freedom, I think this is an exciting area that will have you know, huge impact. And then we'll connect the utility. And we'll finally have electric vehicles, not have 500,000 of them out of 250 million, but have this Uber-like adoption rate that's so exciting. So that's, that's what I would say. Larry. I would advise a young person to go to a really good university and dual major in electrical engineering and business administration, two hmm. elements that have very infrequently been put together successfully, and try to get the, a position as a system planning engineer for a regulated utility. Hmm. Because in, in, in the future, the planning of the system. Mm -hmm. we're, we're going to be re-engineering the entire infrastructure of our electric utilities from the distribution level up through the generation level. And it is going to take a nexus of the ability to understand the technical intricacies of that very, very uh, engineering-oriented complex mm -hmm. infrastructure with a very strong eye toward the business side, toward mm. the consumer adoption mm. side that all of us have been speaking of. And someone that has the nexus of that educational backdrop in a system planning engineer career path, I, I'd love to reset my own time clock to be able to step into that world. It isn't boring, it isn't green. That electrical <laughs> engineer and, and the utility system, that's as boring as it gets, but that, it's gonna be as green as it gets. Tom, uh, give, give some I, career advice to these people. I often go to, uh, of course I'm a little bit biased, but I often go to uh, middle schools or high schools and talk to the kids about you know, energy and, and the changing nature of things. And uh, I think the old tradition was we thought it was uh, boring, but it certainly wasn't I mean, I, I asked them sometimes, who do you think was the most influential people voted by Time magazine of the past century? Uh, and, uh, you know, some of them are surprised to hear that it was Einstein and Edison. Uh, and uh, so that was awfully exciting times for our business. But I, I really think this is the most exciting time in our business since Thomas Edison. I, I think that the uh, innovation and creativity is coming. Uh, the, Workforce of the future are very, very excited, not only about energy, but the environment. This brings it together. We have an Institute for uh, Electric Innovation, a foundation uh, where we talk a lot about these issues. And you know, you might be interested in our latest, uh, in our latest book here, Key Trends Driving Change in the Electric Power Industry. It's a lot of the things we just talked about. Uh, but basically, you've got a quote in there um, from uh, a guy you wouldn't think would say this, but uh, and, and it says that for those who are committed to a clean power future, utilities are the most important investors. And that comes from Ralph Cavana, the co-energy uh, head for the NRDC. Uh, I just think that uh, if you care about the future of this world and the world in general, because it really is not just the United States, it's a pretty exciting place to be. Joe, and if you don't want to go to a utility, okay. come to work for EEI. <laughs> Joe, some career advice. Um, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a great believer that uh, energy and how people use it have, is what de de determines power. Uh, whether it's uh, the, the Babylonians' ability to, to use irrigation, 
to develop a much more sophisticated culture, whether it's the Romans' ability to build roads and be able to deploy their army almost anywhere, or the British putting on high seas and literally finding land to grow so that they didn't have to do it. Use coal to produce more, more horsepower. Uh, the same is going to be true about the future, as it always has been, which is energy is key to that determination. It's not how much you burn, but it's how efficiently you do that. And uh, I don't think Tom uh, uh, or Larry would argue uh, that, uh, that we can do, we, with the energy we have today, we can do much, much more on a, on a global scale. And uh, the responsibility and possibility for that are great. So uh, I don't know if I, I would master in both of those things, but one of them should get you a pretty solid job and uh, it should be a very bright future. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. John, you want to close? Uh, to the National Press Club is the world's leading professional organization for journalists. And on behalf of the club, I want to thank you all for coming today. I want to thank Joe Garcia, Larry Kellerman, Tom Kuhn, Robbie Diamond, and Tom Friedman for being an outstanding panel. And as I now close the program, I'd like to close by showing them our appreciation for this wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you.